Hi, I'm Michelle Shelfont, psychotherapist, holistic life coach, and human, just like you, learning to navigate life's challenges. With over 25 years experience, I teach people how to get healthy using the adult chair model. The adult chair model is where simple psychology meets grounded spirituality, and it teaches us how to become healthy adults. From anxiety and depression to codependency and relationship issues, you can use the adult chair for just about anything. Each week, I share practical tips, tools, and advice from myself and a wide range of experts on how to get unstuck, how to live authentically, and how to truly love yourself all while sitting in your adult chair. Welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. So welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast, Dr. Joe Vitale. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I know. I was just telling you, I think I found you almost 30 years ago or 25 years ago. I'm impressed. (laughs) I'm flattered and impressed Uh, to go that far back means that you knew me when I was doing internet marketing, um, coming out with some of my law of attraction, spiritual material. Uh, That was in the last century. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> You're making us both sound really old. <laughs> I know. I sound prehistoric when I say that, but here we go. I remember I was visiting with someone and I, I, it was in the early nineties, I think. And she handed me a tape, a cassette tape and said, you know, you're a really powerful creator. And I said, oh, well, thank you. And she said, listen to this. And it was an Abraham Hicks yeah. little tape way back when. Right. But but I was already open to all of this. I already had this sense that there was something else going on in the universe. I love talking about energy and all the things. But I think it was sometime right around then that I also discovered you and like all these books started, you know, people would just hand me books to read. And I'm like, thank you, thank you. So uh, I think probably that was that's that's when I found you. So I, I was telling you, I was so excited to have you on because I have like four pages of like questions. Or four and pages, I'm so curious to know what would be on your mind that you fill up four pages. <laughs> I love your story. Which So would you please share your story? You know, you were someone that went from homeless to extremely abundant. So ha- tell us a little bit about how this happened. Oh, well, uh, yes, I was homeless in Dallas, Texas in the late 1970s. I went through poverty for a good 10 years when I made it to Houston. And during all this time, I was trying to be an author. I, I had a dream. I, was, I had a vision and I was pursuing it persistently and really having a difficult time. Mm-hmm. And it was miserable years, suicidal years, depressed years. And yet, you know, buck up and get up every day and write something on the typewriter and send it out through snail mail. There's no internet. There's no computers going in households at that point. So it's a lot of, a lot of struggle. And during that time, I'm still working on myself. When I was homeless, I lived in the Dallas public library and I sat on the floor in the self-improvement section and was devouring all the books. I was always a bookaholic, still a bookaholic. You look at the screen behind me. That's actually not a screen. Those are real books and they're all over the place. So I'm still addicted to books, still growing from books and was doing it back then. But without coaching, without shows like this, without mentoring and trying to do it on my own, it was a very long, excruciatingly slow process. Yet I kept working on myself and I would find little beliefs And there were beliefs that some people have in common that would be watching or listening to this. Things like in order to be creative or or in order to be successful, you had to suffer. And so I made sure I suffered because I had that belief. Mm -hmm. As I went on with my life and started to slowly awaken to self-creation, I realized that some of those beliefs weren't really serving me, not in a very positive growth-oriented way. And I slowly started to get rid of them. My first book was 1984, but I didn't have another book for 10 years. It wasn't until 1992 or three, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And by then the internet's coming along and I was one of the first, I ended up being a pioneer on this Mm -hmm. golden cyberspace quest that we all went on and nobody knew what they were doing, including me, but we were trying everything. So there were a lot of turning points, pivot points, highlights from there. Um, that we can talk about, but I would say in short, to go from homeless to where I'm in, I I live the lifestyle of the rich and famous, I would say today, it's had a whole lot to do with the inner work. 
it had a whole lot to do with cleaning up my perceptions, my beliefs, my paradigm, if you will. I was already taking action, but action alone isn't quite enough. You get to align yourself internally to make things happen. And as I did that, you know, things started to shift. Everything from getting more books published to being invited to being in movies that ended up changing the world, like The Secret, mm -hmm. and going on to be in other movies, recreating myself as a musician. I have 17 albums out, still an author, 80 books out, still in movies, 20 different movies or more at this point that I've appeared in. Uh, I now have my own TV show. I have a podcast going on. Um, my God, so many things we can talk about, but the yeah. inner work is what got me here. So let's talk a little bit about the inner work. That's one of my favorite things. I bet. Um, <laughs> I love inner work because I do believe that. I really believe in order to change the outside reality, you got to go inside. It's not about what's out there. It's not about anybody else. Right. It's about us. Right. And, yeah, I yeah. totally agree with that. Uh, changing the outside is like trying to change your reflection on the mirror. You've got to, or, or I've told people the example is if you stand in front of the mirror and try to put the makeup or shave the mirror, it's not going to work. You've got to do it on you. <laughs> when you do it on you, then the rest of the world can notice and things can change, but it's all an inside job. Yeah. I 100% agree with that. And what I'm hearing you say is that's what you, you started really looking at your beliefs, it sounds like to me, and yes. your limiting beliefs, to yes. be really specific. Mm -hmm. So did you, what happened? Like, did you, how did you start to change those? I mean, give us some ideas, because I, I think about people with their limiting beliefs, and we feel powerless to them. And mm -hmm. we don't realize that we have a choice over what we are not only thinking, but right. we can actually do something about these beliefs. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, that's a big concept and it's an important insight. So I'm glad you're bringing it up because most of us feel like what we're going through, we're destined to go through. Mm -hmm. They feel like it's fate, that it's our DNA, that this is the way God, the universe, our parents, um, we were born into this. We can't do much about that. Mm -hmm. And I know that feeling because that's how I thought. And I thought that this is, this is my path through life, that it was set up before I ever got here. And there are certain tendencies when we're born that we might have. And there's certain epigenetic, scientifically proven traits that we might have. But all of these can be changed. When I was homeless and I was reading the self-improvement books in the public library, there's no coach, there's no mentor, there's no internet, there's nothing that I can go and flesh things out with. So I'm trying to interpret it and understand it entirely on my own. And I had a victim consciousness. So I'm reading Think and Grow Rich. And at the end of Think and Grow Rich, I throw the book against the wall going, I'm not rich. I just read the book. Right. I did, I'm doing what I think he told me to do in the book. And then I would read books like The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol, which mm -hmm. dramatically influenced me because he was basically saying, if you believe it, you could actually create it in your life, but you have to believe it first. Mm -hmm. And I would think, I'm trying to believe it. I can believe <laughs> I can be an author, but where the hell is the publisher? Right. Where's the royalty checks? Where's this fame and fortune? Why am I still on the floor in the public library yeah. struggling with what they're telling me is this is the way you can change change your life, you know? Yeah. And reading Psycho-Cybernetics, all of these books that I mentioned are masterpieces. Mm -hmm. They're masterpieces. These are books that have lived generations and will live forever because they're so profound. Right. But we have to understand them. There's been several people who have said, you have to go back and reread books because mm -hmm. whenever you reread a book, you're yeah. different. You go back to it as a different person. The person that was reading Think and Grow Rich, meaning me in the 1975, 76 or so, is not the same person who reads it today. Today, I read Think and Grow Rich and I go, oh my God, how profound is this? <laughs> One of Napoleon Hill's most famous lines was, if you can conceive it and believe it, you can achieve it. Well, when I read it in the 1970s, I made fun of it. 
Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, I can be a seven foot tall basketball player and I can win all these awards and all this. And I was doing like a lot of people, they become very extreme in their skepticism and they come up with things that actually are ridiculous. I was doing the same thing instead of looking at the quote as I would today. Yeah. And he says, can you conceive it? Which means, can you believe that this is possible? Can I be an author? Do I really, can I conceive being a basketball player who's seven feet tall? No, I can't conceive it. I'm just proving Napoleon Hill correct. He's telling me if you can conceive it and then you can believe it, you can achieve it. So I'm reading these books. I'm wrestling with these concepts, but because I sincerely wanted to be a published author, I had that vision there. I took it to heart. I'd look in the mirror in the bathroom at the public library in Dallas, <laughs> and I would look at myself and say, okay, if I created this reality that I'm in homeless and starving and no car, no, and nothing. What, what might I be believing that would have created this? Mm. And I started to just kind of poke my finger at the idea that, well, maybe I'm responsible. <laughs> and again, this is tough. This is hard work, especially when you're doing it alone, because I'm facing the reality of, I put myself through misery I put myself through homelessness. I put myself through the most, oh, despicable, uncomfortable, hard to imagine situations because I thought I needed to. When I started to wrestle with those beliefs, I slowly made progress. And then when I looked deeper to find out, okay, why would I believe that I have to struggle? And this is what I'm inviting everybody to do. I'm hoping that they're looking at my story as a teaching tale and they can reflect to themselves, what am I believing to create my life right now? Where did that belief come from? Mm -hmm. So as I investigated with myself, I realized this was a bolt of lightning down my spine. I realized that I thought in order to be a successful author, like the authors I admired, I had to struggle like they did. Mm. One of the authors that was my hero was Jack London. Mm -hmm. Jack London wrote The Call of the Wild and White Fang and Martin Eden. He wrote 50 some books and I still love his writing today, but I made a fundamental mistake. I modeled my lifestyle after his lifestyle instead of modeling my writing style after his writing style. Mm -hmm. When I modeled after his lifestyle, he had been alcoholic. He had been um, depressed. He was a wildly adventurous and very dramatic. He lived in the slums of London at one point. He was dead by the age of 40 by his own hand. Wow. I didn't even know that. And then the other author I was admiring was Ernest Hemingway. Mm. Tight, terse, writing, famous author. He shot himself. Mm-hmm at the end of his life. And after a very alcoholic, womanizing, you know, partying, boozing, mm -hmm. you know, crazy life. I thought in my unconscious, this is the other thing that everybody needs to realize, you're not purposely, consciously choosing most of these beliefs. Most of them you've absorbed and you welcome them without any conscious discernment. And I had done the same thing. I'm reading Jack London's biography. I'm reading Ernest Hemingway biographies. And I'm going, wow, I want a life like that. And I want to be great like that. And I want to be a successful author like that. And so unconsciously, I came to the conclusion, well, I need to go out there and struggle like that. Mm -hmm. So in the Dallas Public Library, wrestling with all these, looking in the mirror and realizing, wait a minute, is that true? Do I actually need to struggle like Jack London and Ernest Hemingway in order to be a successful author? Is it possible that there are successful authors out there that I haven't really studied that are healthy, happy, well-adjusted, prolific, productive, and got their fame and fortune and their publication and everything else without destroying their lives or their families? And I thought, oh, it's bound to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I started looking for them and I find Ray Bradbury and, you know, some other authors and I start looking, oh, I just need to model somebody else. <laughs> and I use my beliefs. But, you know, this is the work we have to do. The good news for everybody watching or listening is that it's a far easier process and faster process today because of 
your work, what you're doing individually with people, and because of your show. Now we can rush ahead. We can wake up sooner. We don't have to struggle as long. We can go, oh, aha, this is why I've been struggling and snap out of it, so to speak. Get rid of that belief, exchange it, dilute it, put it in another belief, whatever it happens to be to keep us going forward to our vision, but in a happier, healthier way. Mm. That was so good. And I'm li- I'm thinking about, okay, what? Are, how would people respond? They're going to say to you, but how, Dr. Joe? <laughs> yeah, you know, how, how do we, is- it's not that easy. You know, people are going to say, <laughs> I, you know, I, I can't, you know, I'm only making, let's just say I'm making $50,000 a year and you're telling me I can go make $200,000 a year. That's impossible. I'm working at a job where this is the salary and how would I ever do that? So what would you yeah, say? Yeah, those that? are, those are great objections. <laughs> and as you can imagine, at this point in my life, I got, I got an answer for everything. I would imagine. <laughs> and if I don't have a prepackaged answer, I'll come up with one. You know, we'll, we'll think of it. Well, first of all, the how is the number one thing that stops people. Everybody wants to know how. How do I get from yeah. here to there? Yeah. And the truth of the matter is you don't know how. You don't know how, as you're sitting here in present reality, in current reality, wondering how do I get to the $200,000 or the mansion or the new relationship or better health, whatever it is. You don't know how. And as soon as you face that, now you can move forward. Because what you do know is what do you want? And if for those that are watching that go, I don't even know what I want, all you have to do, and I wrote about this in my book, The Attractor Factor, is look at what you're complaining about. You're complaining, I don't have enough time or I don't have enough money or I'm tired of being alone or I'm tired of my back hurting. Okay, that's what you're complaining about. You flip it to state what you want. I want to have more than enough money. I want to be in a relationship. I want to heal my back. Now you know what you want. All right. Once you know what you want, you take whatever the baby steps are to move in the direction of it. Most of us sit here going, give me the plan. Tell me how to go from, to jump from here to there. There is no plan. There is no strategy. There is no map to help you jump, mm-hmm. but you can start here. My, one of my favorite quotes is from Theodore Roosevelt, who said, do what you can with what you have right where you are. Oh, mm-hmm. that cuts through all of it. Yeah. Do what you can with what you have right where you are. When I was in the poverty years and still wanting to write, I had a $5 typewriter. I mean, I didn't have a computer. I don't think we had personal computers then. Or if we did, I certainly wasn't in the ballpark to buy one. And my my ribbon portable typewriter was the kind you had to punch the keys. And this is where you start. You start by punching every one of those keys to get a document done and then going through the material to send it out. So the big thing is you got to drop the how. You don't know how. Steve Jobs said you can connect the dots looking backwards. You cannot connect the dots looking forward. Mm. Meaning that when you're sitting here, you don't know how to get to your vision, to the end result, to the manifestation of it, the attraction of it, whatever word you want to use. But once you arrive, you can turn around and see, oh, that dot led to that dot, that step led to that step. All of it will start to make sense. But when you're in this moment looking forward, you don't have the path. The other thing that you pointed out is, I'm making $50,000 a year. Can I really make $200,000 a year? Hell yes, and more. One of my other favorite stories is I was brought to Thailand a few years ago by a young man I had never met before. And in fact, I didn't even want to go. But uh, I kept raising my rates and he paid them. So he bought my enthusiasm. (laughs) I went to Thailand. And then there was a turning point in my life because I met him. He was 35 years old at the time. And he told me the most profound stories. 15 years earlier, he was homeless, 20 years old, homeless in Thailand, sleeping on the beach, no money, no car, no nothing. And he calls a friend of his from his home, which was in Sweden. He had left Sweden because he hated the cold and the dark, ends up in Thailand, goes homeless. Calls a friend in Sweden and says, I need help. And the friend says, and I I still marvel at this. The friend said, I'm not going to send you any money, but I'll send you a book. It's like, who says that? I would have sent money and a book. Right. But he said, I'm not going to send you money. I'll send you a book. He sends them the book, The Secret, which is what was based on the movie. The movie was mm-hmm. first in 2006. Right after it, there was a book based on the movie. He gets the book. 
and he's mad. He's starving. He's homeless. He doesn't want a book. <laughs> but he thought, well, the guy sent it to me. Maybe there's something to it. And he starts reading it. He gets even angrier thinking none of this stuff is going to work. I'm homeless. This stuff, visualization, manifestation, intention, you know, all of this, this is nonsense. So he does something that I think was remarkable. He says, I'm going to prove this book wrong. Ooh. I'm going to prove this stuff doesn't work. And he starts out on little things, which I think is brilliant. He said, uh, let me see if I can manifest a cup of coffee. And he does all the things, visualizing and all this. And somebody buys him a cup of coffee. I think, oh, that's a coincidence. That's a fluke. And he says, let me try lunch. And he visualizes, blah, blah, blah. And somebody buys him lunch. And he's going, uh, maybe I'll try something bigger. And he tries a part-time job. He gets a part-time job. Long story short, when I'm meeting this guy at the airport in Bangkok, Thailand, he's 35 years old. He's a billionaire. What? A billionaire, not a millionaire, not a multimillionaire, wow. a billionaire. He has the largest real estate company in Southern Thailand. More than that, he has 20 other businesses, coffee shops, a gym, an attorney's studio, and I forget all the different ones that he had. And he's telling me all of this as I'm standing waiting for my baggage. And I'm thinking, my God, what, what a, of the most inspiring stories I ever heard. And then he says, you're here because I wanted to thank you. I'm here because of you. And he said, me, Bob Proctor, Jack Canfield, whatever standout teachers were in the movie, The Secret is what inspired him to go from penniless to billionaire. So if somebody's sitting there and they said what you had said, I'd make $50,000 a year. Is it really possible to make $200,000? i am going, give me a freaking break. Think <laughs> even bigger than that. Of course you can go from 50 to 200. When I talk about me being homeless and now living the lifestyle of the rich and famous, you know, some people might say, oh, that's a fluke or you were lucky. But then I go and say, wait a minute, here's this guy. His name's Andres Pira uh -huh. in Thailand. And I helped him write his book. It's called Homeless to Billionaire. Go read really? his story. If you don't believe me and my story, go read his story. And these are just examples. There's so many people that have gone from nothing or enlarged what they already had because they believed it. They, well, they did what Napoleon Hill said. They could conceive it. They could believe it. And then they could achieve it. Wow. What a story. <laughs> Yes. I'm going to have to, what is his name? I'm putting him in the show notes for sure. Andres Pira, A-N-D-R-E-S. Mm-hmm. P-I-R-A. And the book we co-authored it. It's called Homeless to Billionaire. Well worth reading. Wow. I'm gonna and in fact, you should interview him at some point. I, I was just thinking I'll probably have him on the show. That's I will cool make now. an introduction. I would point. love that. Thank you. Definitely. I'd love to have him on. I love these stories. <laughs> okay. So I, I way back when, actually about 20 years ago. Wait, when did the secret come out? 2006. I was teaching law of attraction classes right before the secret came out. Mm -hmm. So sometime in the early 2000s, I used to teach these law of attraction courses. I used to teach um, vision boarding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All the stuff, right. right? And people would come in and then the secret came out, right? So then when I taught the class, of course, tons of people wanted, oh, we want to learn how to do this. I want to ask you this question because I used to get this question quite a bit. The secret doesn't work to, for me. <laughs> I'm like, law of attraction doesn't work. Are you singled out? Like, it's like saying gravity doesn't work for me. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? So first of all, I think we need to talk about, or I'd love to hear your words on what is the law of attraction? And then what do you say to people that would say to you, Dr. Joe, that doesn't work for me. I've tried. Because right. I'm sure you've heard it about a million times. <laughs> yes, I, I've heard it. And yeah, there were... <laughs> It's a common thing when people don't really think very deeply or reflect on their own life. Mm -hmm. They just sort of dismiss it. And there's a little bit of a self-sabotage there when they dismiss it because mm -hmm. they're basically giving them an excuse not to go for their dreams. They're yeah. basically saying, well, that stuff doesn't work. A little bit like Andres Pira saying, this isn't going to work. And let me prove it doesn't work. And then, of course, he shocks even himself and becomes a billionaire by proving it doesn't work. Yeah. So I, I point out to people, do you, uh, do you worry? 
And they'll say yes. Do you stay awake at night thinking about how things can go wrong? Oh, yes. And how are things going? Well, they're going wrong, and there's more to worry about. I'm trying to point out you're already practicing the law of attraction. You're just practicing it in reverse. Instead of practicing by focusing and intending what you would like to have, you're letting your mind go to its default, which for most of us is the negative. And we're all hardwired for survival. And so our mind is always looking around for what is a threat to our survival. It's always focused on what could go wrong, what could go bad. And we get sucked into that. What I teach people is that, you know, you can program your mind to do something besides survival. Mm -hmm. Definitely survival is important. It's, that's already working. You're already programmed for that. You can ask your brain, which will work and co-create with the universe that were divine, whatever you want to call it to bring more into your life by choosing where you would like to go. So I try to explain to them, you're already using the law of attraction. What you're getting or not giving, getting is a direct result of your unconscious subconscious beliefs. Mm -hmm. There's enough evidence out there from people like me, Andres Piro and tens of thousands of people yeah. who have changed their lives by intentionally going in a particular direction to prove that the law of attraction worked. The law of attraction may be misnamed a little bit because it's more of a principle. And it's actually from psychology that is saying you get more of whatever you focus on. Mm -hmm. Most of us focus on what we're afraid of or what we're angry about. Well, fear and hate are two of the most powerful manifesting emotions that there are. And as long as you focus on what you're afraid of or what you hate, you're going to get more of it. There's further proof that you are attracting what you're focused on. What I advise people to do is I say the three big motivators emotion-wise, emotions fire for creating what you want with the law of attraction are love, hate, and fear. How about focusing on what you love? How about going for your passion? How about declaring what you would like to have, do, or be, and looking at it with your heart open and the, the longing of desire, because this is what you would love to experience. You will move in that direction. Too many of us are sucked into social media, which ends up being a, a digital fist fight. Everybody is complaining, and they're all complaining with each other. They're manifesting more of that because they're focused on the hate and the fear. So what I keep advising people to do is, look, you can continue that way if you like. Just realize it's your choice. As long as you realize it's your choice, then, you know, go ahead and choose it. But if you realize it's your choice, wouldn't you like to be happier? Wouldn't you like to be healthier? Wouldn't you like to be more secure? Wouldn't you like to be living a luxurious life? And even if they say money is nothing to me, well, do you care about other people? Do you care about other countries? Right now, as you and I are talking, Russia is bombing Ukraine. I, the last two countries I was in was Ukraine and Russia. I got friends in both places. The more money you can bring in, the more you can make a difference to the people you care about, like the people mm -hmm. losing their homes in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot that I can say about this. I can turn this into a seminar, but I'm, I'm just trying to answer the question. Yeah. So... Define, though, what is this law of attraction? What it's is the way it? of using your mind. You tend to get whatever you're focused on. Mm -hmm. And so your mind, you can even just eliminate all the metaphysical mumbo jumbo, which really confuses a lot of people, and just say, this is how your brain works. Mm -hmm. Whatever you focus on, you will tend to see all around you, and you will tend to bring more of it into your awareness. If you look at brain science, brain science says there's about 4 million bits of information in every second. 4 million bits of information going around us right now. Because we're only focused on maybe seven items, that's all we get to see. The brain is attracting to us what it thinks is relevant. For most of us, it's survival, which is cool. We want to survive. But what I keep advising people is you use the very thing that we're calling the law of attraction to bring into your life more of what you want by choosing to see what you want. So the law of attraction is how your brain works. It is bringing to you what you're focused on. So what about this? What about, let's just say, I say, okay, let's just pretend I'm making 50,000. I want to go for 200,000. So every day I'm going to start thinking consciously, <clears throat> I'm going to make 200,000. I'm visualizing myself. 
at, you know, my accountant's telling me at the end of the year, I'm making 200,000. I'm bringing checks in every month. Like I'm really getting into that, the feeling, the vibration, the energy of 200,000, right? But what if I have unconscious beliefs that I don't even know about? Yeah. that are completely opposite. What if my unconscious beliefs that I'm not aware of say to me are saying, and they're stronger than the little conscious beliefs we have. I mean, it's the iceberg analogy, right? So yeah. I got these little baby conscious beliefs. And I've got these big undercurrent, the undercurrent says, or the under, the unconscious belief says, you'll never amount to anything. Uh, you've got to work really, really, really hard for every dime you make. You'll never get advanced, you know, whatever all the beliefs are. So they really do get in the way. And, and when I used to talk to people, because I'm also a therapist, so I, and I love working with the unconscious mind. I love it because that is where, to me, the magic is. It's like, when we can start tweaking that, then, and releasing some of these limiting beliefs, that's when you see things really start to manifest. So what is your belief about that? I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Because I think that they can block our conscious beliefs. So even if we're focusing on 200,000 and visualizing it, unconsciously, if I've got the opposite, I can't get that $200,000 a year job. I totally agree. And in fact, what I call it, uh, I say that is the missing secret yeah. to manifesting what you want in life. In fact, one of my all-time best-selling audio programs is called The Missing Secret. Mm -hmm. Came out with Nightingale Conant right after The Secret. And then The Secret comes out. And of course, there were a whole lot of fans for it, but there were a whole lot of skeptics and a whole lot of critics. And I defended yeah. the movie by saying, Look, it's a freaking movie, folks. It's all it's doing is introducing a concept to you. It's not the graduate course. Right. And then I thought, well, they don't really understand. And, and I think this personally is one of my contributions to the whole self-improvement movement to understand that there is a missing secret and you just illustrated it beautifully you can go for anything that you want you can choose it and start to move towards it but if in your subconscious slash unconscious mind you have what i call counter intentions mm -hmm. which are opposing beliefs mm -hmm. you will slow down stop and probably self-sabotage your own efforts to get there Mm -hmm. One of my examples, because I've written several books on attracting money, attract money now, the awakened millionaire, money loves speed, uh, the abundance paradigm, the karmic marketing, all of these are money oriented books. And I've pointed out that I have been to so many different countries right before the pandemic, everything from uh, Iran to Russia to Ukraine to Peru to Italy to Poland. Every one of these countries has a belief culturally installed in them and mm -hmm. it's the same belief virtually everybody watching the show is happening has in them right now but consciously they're not thinking about it i'm going to illustrate what it is first of all i invite everybody to want to increase their finances so if they're making the 50 and they want 200,000 or they're making the 200,000 and they want half a million whatever it happens to be choose it select it intend it intentions are powerful the first thing that happens for most of us are the self doubts or the things that start to surface like, well, that'll never happen, or it can't happen in this economy, or it can't happen because of the pandemic, or it's never happened in my family before, or I've never made more than blah, blah, blah. All of those are limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. But there's one more insidious that's down there. And that is money is the root of all. Everybody watching just said evil. Yeah, money right? is the root <laughs> of like, all evil. And? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We all said it. And I noticed this in countries that you wouldn't think so true. would have had that. Yeah. And they all have it. And so now we want to look and, and go a little deeper. And, and again, all of this is internal work. We want to go deep with it. We go a little deeper and we realize, wait a minute, I want to have more money. But if I think money's evil, am I going to really allow myself to have more money? Mm. There have been plenty of stories of people who have won the lottery. And that's another thing. People will go, yeah. oh, if I can just win the lottery. Well, a lot of people mm -hmm. have won the lottery. And a year, two years later, they're more broke than when they got their ticket and they got the, the money. Why? There was a lot of them that hadn't grown into accepting that much money. And if they think money is the root of all evil, are they really going to want evil in their lives? Mm -mm. They're going to get rid of it. They'll give it away. They'll flush it away. They'll spend it. They will find some other ways to just buy things that are ridiculous not really knowing what they're doing because consciously they'll go, yeah, that $2 billion car or $2 million car is probably worth it. I got the money. Let me go buy it. Do enough of that. And you're broke right. whether you won the lottery or not. 
And so what I do is, because I want to make sure I follow through on this, money is the root of all evil is a fragment of a longer statement from biblical literature. The longer statement is the love of money is the root of all evil. Okay, that's a little better. It's not saying money itself is bad. It's saying that the love of money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have to go and realize that the wealthy people like Andres P. Rowe and maybe myself, mm -hmm. we're not in love with money. Yeah. We appreciate money. We yeah. use money. We leverage money, but we're not in love with money. Mm -hmm. I've often quoted Walt Disney who said that I want to make money from my movies so I can make more movies. Mm -hmm. oh, that's the that. purity. I want to make money from my books so I can make more books. I right. want to make money from my music so I can make more music. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm doing with your viewers right now is helping them release that negative belief. Yeah. You are free to have money in your life when you realize it's not bad, it's not corrupting, it's not evil. I often pick up a pen and say, it's like saying the pen is evil. Maybe with a pen I can stab you or I can write a nasty note or something, but it's not the pen, it's right. me. It's not wow. money. Money in and of itself is absolutely neutral. What about somebody that feels like unworthy or not yeah. deserving or not yep, good enough? What if they have other limiting beliefs around them? Yeah. Well, that's one of the top three that prevents people from having money or virtually anything else. Yeah. And also what I struggled with, especially when anybody had been homeless or in poverty, your self-esteem is flatlined. Yeah. You know, it's bottomed out. And so one of the things I said in my book, Attract Money Now, which is free, anybody can go to attractmoneynow.com, free book. Go read it. Seven steps in there. And the very first step is about mindset. And I mentioned in that very first step about money is the root of all evil to get rid of it. And then the second one is I'm not good enough mm -hmm. slash I don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. And this is the self-nurturing work. And I had to do it. I remember standing in front of the mirror and I didn't like myself. Standing in front of the mirror, you know, homeless and poverty, struggling is like, Jesus, I don't like myself at all. And I'd have to look and go, okay, what do I like? Yeah. Well, I had always heard that people like my dimples. And I thought, okay, let's start there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got something <laughs> that uh, the public and myself can approve of. And from there, go into, you know, somebody once said I had bedroom eyes. And it's like, I don't know what bedroom eyes are, but that sounds good. Let me go with that. And so I slowly started to, to look in the mirror. And this is stuff Louise Hay and other people yeah. have talked about, going, looking in the mirror and starting to love yourself. And we don't mean an egotistical, I'm the greatest kind of a thing. We mean the, the self-acceptance, the self-nurturing, the self-welcoming. So anybody feeling like uh, I'm not good enough or I, I don't deserve it needs to do that internal work and question those beliefs. Very often, we grew up by parents who were very well-meaning and were taking care of us, but they told us no, and they told us versions of not good enough. Enough times for us to conclude, well, there must be something wrong with me. I must be shortcoming in some way. I must be different in some way. Um, maybe I can't be the one that can have anything in my life. This mm -hmm. was all the programming that we received. Mm -hmm. But now, in this point in time, as adults, as we're awakening, we can look at all of that and go, is it true? And if it is true, well, can I change it? Can I question it and dismantle it and hopefully even replace it to go, you know what? I was given the gift of life by God, the divine, the universe, the great something, the cosmos, whatever you want to call this. And uh, that alone makes me worth it. I love that. Um <clears throat> So it's a slow process of really learning how to love yourself and looking in the mirror and doing the, which is a lot of the, the same things I talk about too. So I, I'm yeah. right on board with you. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears because I know we don't have a lot of time left because I really do want to talk about this. This is something that I actually use in some of my live events. And I was telling you before we started, it brings the house right. down. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, I always have Kleenex at my events because there's always a lot of crying. Because in my opinion, you know, it's it's a good thing. It's a lot of processing. It's a lot of releasing. Let's talk about Ho Pono Pono. Yeah. You know, people. I, I'm hoping everyone's heard of that term, but you know, I don't know. So let us know as 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 much as you can about that. I know we're running out of time, so it's totally fine. Ho Pono Pono is life-changing and miracle-triggering. 
it is a profound healing technique out of Hawaii. And I was fortunate enough to bring it to the world through my first book on it called Zero Limits. Mm -hmm. I've since written two books about the whole thing. Ho'oponopono, in short, is very simple. It's a way to communicate with your concept of the divine. You can call it God, the universe, the cosmos, the great something, Gaia, the higher power, whatever you want to call it. And it's a way of forgiveness, mm -hmm. of releasing limiting beliefs, and moving in the direction of allowing divinity to inspire you as you move into the gratitude of the miracle of now. Mm -hmm. So let me explain all of this uh, as best I can. Mm -hmm. I had heard this amazing story and it, ironically, it was during the time that the secret was produced and the secret started going out and I was being asked to go on Larry King and a bunch of other places as part of me was not interested in the law of attraction anymore. Uh -huh. It was like, I'm moving past this. And yet, <laughs> You've mastered it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Oprah and everybody wants me to come on and talk about it. And it's like, I got something else I want to talk about. But, you know, I went with the flow and the publicity. And during that time, I had heard the story about a therapist who helped heal an entire ward of mentally ill criminals. And he did it without actually working directly with them. And I thought, this is nuts. I, I know about magic and miracles. And I've read some pretty amazing stories. But for a therapist to heal mentally ill criminals at a state hospital for the criminally insane and not actually work with them directly, he did some sort of mojo, woo-woo, esoteric, mystical what. And nobody could even tell me the story, and they couldn't pronounce the word at that point. And there was nothing out there literature-wise. But I became obsessed because I thought, if the story's true, I need to know what his technique is so I can help other people. Yeah. And I went there as a good journalist to look for him. I even hired a private investigator <laughs> to find him. And I found the therapist, Dr. E. Haleakula Hulen. He told me the story. He told me what he was doing. And it was all, it's very much what you and I talk about all the time here. Mm -hmm. It's an inside job. Yeah. He was able to help those patients who were so dangerous. They were shackled on or sedated every day. Imagine this. I mean, it's a state hospital for criminally insane people who were sentenced there. And they're so dangerous and so angry and unpredictable. They're sedated or shackled every day. And other doctors and nurses were quitting because they hated the environment. And so this guy, Dr. Hulen, kind of goes over there and says, well, I'll go when I work there, but I'm not going to work directly with the patients. And I'm going to do something you never heard of called Ho'oponopono. So what he's doing is that he would look at their charts and as he looked at their charts, he had his emotional responses. I mean, they were rapists, they were killers, they were doing dastardly things. And so he's, he's feeling anger, he's feeling rage, he's feeling embarrassment, he's feeling grief, he's feeling shock, he's going through all of his emotions. As he's feeling them, he's doing this crazy thing called Ho'oponopono, which means he's feeling what he's feeling. And then he communicates with what he called the great divine. Mm -hmm. And he's communicating with them saying four phrases. I love you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And I, again, I, I worked with Dr. Hulan. He and I did three seminars together. We did the book together, Zero Limits, the first one. I spent a lot of time with him. I heard all of this story. I actually talked to the social workers that had been there. And I heard all of this on the most magical, almost unexplainable level was an inside experience as he worked on himself, which is our theme for today with this show, mm -hmm. as he worked on himself, mm -hmm. saying, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, as a kind of prayer petition to the great something, as he's looking at their charts, those patients started to get better. As he got better, the mirror reflection, those patients, they started to get better. Within a very short period of time, they were starting to be pronounced healed, and fit to go back into society. And I think it was in four years, that particular ward was closed. Because of so him. I, because of him. Insane. Because of him and what he was doing. Now, when I talked yeah. to him, he would never say it was because of him. Yeah. He said all he was doing was cleaning. Mm 
and clearing. And this is the lesson everybody needs to get. I remember when I was living in Wimberley, Texas at the time, and he flew uh, to Wimberley, Texas. I put him up at a bed and breakfast kind of thing. And I left him alone for a while because we were researching and writing the book, Zero Limits. Mm -hmm. And I picked him up later and I said, uh, you know, making conversation, what have you been doing? <laughs> and he said, well, I, I was watching the news. And I was appalled. And I tell people, don't ever watch the news. Yeah, turn, I do too. <laughs> turn, turn the mainstream news off, man. It's please, programming. It's just they're going to corrupt your brain and put you yeah. in the negativity, low your vibration. And here's this guru telling me he's watching the news. And I said, you, you're what? And he says, yeah. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, it's an opportunity for me to clean. And what he meant was, as he's watching the news, he's reacting anger, fear, whatever, he's reacting inside of himself. Mm -hmm. Whatever he's reacting with is what he's cleaning on. The cleaning is repeating the four phrases of Ho'oponopono. So he was using any and all experiences, anything that was in what we would call unhappiness, any version of unhappiness that was welling up in him, he was saying, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, to dilute that feeling. As he's getting closer to a sense of peace, we are sending out a different signal, much like at the mental hospital, that mm -hmm. affected the outer reality. Wow. In Ho'oponopono, the whole world is really a mirror. So yeah. when you change yeah. yourself, it's reflected by the whole world that you're in. There's so much to say about this. This yeah, is why I, I ended up we writing talk three about books. This for three hours. <laughs> this is so good. So question. Um, and I love that. I remember reading this in the book, Zero, Zero Limits. I was shocked. I was like, oh my goodness. Like how... The whole place shut down because of him. And he never even met with those patients, which was right. crazy. It really does say the world is made up of energy. We're energy yes. beings, yeah, right? I, I got chills time. even reliving those moments, yes. So, so for someone that's listening to the show today, what can they do? So, and I want to be clear. So he, when he was working with those patients, he's taken in, or the news, which mm -hmm. thank God you said the same thing. I'm like, turn off the news. It lowers the <laughs> vibration. Like don't eat. I'm yeah. so much happier by not watching the news. It's phenomenal. Right, me too. Anyway. So, but when he was working with the patients, he took the energy of the patient. So he'd read something and he was in horror, let's say like, oh my gosh, you know, this person raped somebody and killed someone. And then he just sat and said those, the, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you over and over again until it was like a neutral state or peaceful. Yes. Okay. So yes. if I'm sitting listening to the show today and I'm someone that's depressed, has major trauma, anxiety, fill in the blank, whatever it might be, a relationship struggles, how would I use that? Would I feel the trauma? Would I feel my depression and say these words? I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Over and over and over again until I'm neutral. How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So let's invite everybody to experience it right now. Yeah. The people that are listening or watching call up something that's upsetting to you. And it's usually pretty easy for us. You know, there's somebody who said something, there's something we're still chewing on. There's a problem we're wrestling with. Mm -hmm. There's an issue of some sort. Most of us are not sitting around going, I'm just in bliss. You yeah. know, most of us are, are sitting around going, I need to get this resolved or I'm upset about blah, blah, blah. Whatever it is for you, allow something, pick one thing okay. to come up. And once it's in your awareness, cool. Because it's in your awareness, you're probably feeling something. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Hulen used to say in the seminars we did together, have you ever noticed that when you have a problem, you are there? Mm -hmm. And what he was pointing out is that you're the common denominator in what you're calling a problem. Mm -hmm. You're the one perceiving it. The problem actually isn't out there. Where you're feeling it is in you. Mm. You can only feel it inside of you. It's whatever mm -hmm. you're saying, oh, my neighbor did such and such. Yeah, but where are you feeling this upset? It's not over there. It's not with the neighbor. It's in you. So we bring all of the attention inside of ourselves. And usually it's chest oriented. That's why I'm touching my chest. But yeah. wherever you feel it inside, it could be a head thing in your face. It can be in your body, anywhere. And as you're feeling it, this is where you pretend that you're talking to your creator. And I'm saying creative because it's probably different for everybody watching. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hulen would say the divine. And you really do pretend you're having a, you know, you called them up. You picked up your cell phone and you're calling up God. Mm -hmm. And you're basically saying, this feels like crap. 
yeah. inside of me. And you don't need to know the beliefs. You don't have to go and speculate on where it came from. We don't care about the how. We don't even care about the belief. If you got a belief, that's fine. Right. But you, you got a feeling. And if you can feel it, you can heal it. So you have this feeling. And now, quietly, internally, you're not saying this out loud. You're saying this internally to your connection to God. And you're saying, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. And say it in any order. You don't have to feel any of the statements when you first start saying them. As you say them, you'll probably feel something that goes with the statements. Mm -hmm. I always take the opportunity, and I, I want to do it here to explain what the four statements are actually doing. Mm -hmm. When you say, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, you're basically saying, I'm sorry for any part of me, my mindset, my paradigm, my belief system, whatever, that contributed to the creation of this. Mm -hmm. Please forgive me for being unconscious. Mm -hmm. Please forgive me, or in Ho'oponopono, they would say, or my ancestors, mm -hmm. because we could have downloaded this, yeah. and it's now exp being expressed inside of ourselves. Lineage. It's coming right yes. down. We're not even, we don't even know where it came from. Yeah. Right. Epigenetic, genetics and sciences, it could come from generations past. We don't care. But we want to say, I'm sorry for my ancestors or for right. me being unconscious. Thank you for removing whatever is triggering this. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for cleaning me. Thank mm. you for clearing me. Thank you for my life. Mm -hmm. And I love you, which I love saying, I love you is moving in the direction of the neutrality of the miracle of life. When you say, I love you, you're saying, I love you for my life. I love you for this process. I love you for taking care of the issue. I love you mm -hmm. and all the different things that love would mean. Mm -hmm. So the, in a very simple form, you're just saying, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Any order. And you're saying it enough times that yeah, it's kind of like a meditation that's therapeutically cleaning and relieving the issue. And people often say, how often do you say it? I agree with Dr. Hulan. Never stop. Mm. <laughs> it's so easy to do. Yeah. You know, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Actually, for me at this point, I've been doing it 15 years, I think. It's the background audio. As I'm talking to you, as I'm answering questions, the background audio is I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. It's like a tape mm -hmm. that is now playing. In the old days, it would have been a self-critical, self-talk kind of a second-guessing kind of an audio. Mm -hmm. Now, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me is the background. And thank you is the background in my own head. So for, so for someone sitting at home and they're feeling depressed, let's say, and they're saying this, they're saying it to themselves. They can say it in any order that I did mm -hmm. not know. Um, but would they say it once or do you, and I hear what you're saying, say it throughout the day. But if I'm doing a, a few moments of this, would I say it like kind of repeatedly for five minutes or 10, like give me some sort of. Yeah. I don't think that there is a rule of thumb there other than paying feel attention. Better? To like does the energy clear? Yeah. Yes, so maybe yes. is it until the energy clears. So if I'm feeling anxious, you just say it over and over until you feel this, like some sort of shift inside. I, I would say yes. Okay. I have found in my experience that Ho'oponopono works best and fastest when you're actually truly feeling the emotion. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing we just sit there and go, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I think that's good. I think that I call it cleaning the pathway through life. You know, it's like the street yeah. cleaners who come out at three in the morning. Yeah. We are saying, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you to send out the energy to clean our path before we get to any bumps in the road. Mm. However, if you're truly going through something and you're upset, drop, get quiet, turn within I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you repeatedly until that seems like it's diluting because the clearer you get to feeling comfortable and releasing it, the faster it manifests on the outside world. Mm. That was my next question. So if I'm someone that's, again, sitting here with trauma or depression, or whatever the heck it might be, I'm not going to do this once and my depression I've had for four years is gone but it will shift it in some way. And then when I, I can do it again and again and again, and then mm -hmm. I'm feeling from what you're saying, like it just starts to shift on its own at some point. Yes. Right? And at the same time, I want to make sure that I, I know that it could go, the four-year depression could go. See, my TV show is called Zero Limits Living because I'm using it as an experiment. I don't know that we have any actual limits in life. 
Mm -hmm. And so I'm bringing on guests and so forth to talk about what are perceived limits. When somebody says, I've had depression for four years, I can't get rid of it overnight, that is a belief. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying one way or the other, but I am saying if I was on my TV show, Zero Limits Living, I'd say, let's question that. Yeah. Because with Zero Limits and Ho'oponopono, I think the possibility is there that whatever has been going on can be released. And why not quickly? Yeah. It seems to me the only limits we have are mental constructs. And so I'm at least questioning them. Yeah. And, and we're working, you know, and I say this all the time, it's, it's not linear and I'm trying to yeah. make it linear yes. for people listening, but I'm realizing as I talk to you, I'm like, this is not linear. It's right. not like, let me do this, like a, let me do this four or five times and then it'll totally be gone. I think it's different for everyone. And it probably could go in one time. Yes. It absolutely uh, could. Yeah. yeah. We live, we live in a world where we can have these incredible miraculous changes like that. If you believe it too, if you're open to if it, you, you got to be open to it. What a, yes. what a great way to, so, so to tie this all up with a beautiful little bow, <laughs> if I'm working with law of attraction, right? So I'm saying I'm going from 50,000 to 200,000. I realize, wow, even thinking those thoughts gives me a knot in my stomach, right? I get a tight chest. I can do Ho'oponopono yes. Yes. and clear yes. those limiting beliefs because the limiting yes. beliefs are in the way. Yes. Done. Yeah, and that's it. That's actually <laughs> that's perfectly how I use law of attraction because you can't dismiss law of attraction. It's like, well, I don't do law of gravity anymore. It's like, give me a break. Of course you're doing law of gravity. Exactly. Of course you're doing law of attraction. Let's do it with conscious awareness and intent. Yeah. So if I choose that I'm going to go and do something, but I notice I have feelings of anxiety or even self doubt, one of the tools that I can use to get clear of that is ho'oponopono. I don't okay. need to know with any sort of detailed story where something came from, I can in this moment turn within and go, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. In any order, talking to myself, you never say it to another person or you don't need to say it to another person because it's an internal conversation with your creator. Oh, I love it. This was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Where would people find you, Dr. Joe? I'm not hiding. I'm all over the internet. <laughs> You're all over the place. I know. Just Google your name. But what's your website? Give us a few ideas. Where's your television show? Uh, ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. And it's everywhere. It's on Amazon. It's on Apple TV. It's on Roku. It's on 1,000 audio platforms like Spotify. Okay. I think the simple thing is just go to ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. And you can sign up for notifications or you can see all the shows. I'm posting them as we do them right there. Awesome. And, and my books are all on Amazon. I've written over 80 books and Zero Limits. The follow-up to Zero Limits was at zero. And then the third book in the trilogy was uh, The Fifth Phrase. And all of those are on Amazon. My music, I'm a musician. It's on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, wherever music is found. <laughs> and what's your, what's your website? I got a lot of websites. All right. <laughs> Google your, just Google your name, Dr. Joe Vitale. And I will put that in the show notes too. But <laughs> All right. Well, if they go to Dr. Joe Vitale or joevitale.com, that's one of the websites. Awesome. Thank you so, so much for today. This was so great. It's just, again, oh. it was an, it's an honor having you on after all these years of following your work. And, and now, now I get to say, Hey, I met him and I know him. So thank you. But, oh, I greatly enjoyed it. I love what you're doing. Godspeed to all your viewers, listeners, and thank you again. I'm grateful. Thank you.